ladies and gentlemen, please welcome entrepreneur, explorer, and U.S. Army veteran, Dan Futrell. This, this is dangerous. It's dangerous. This is an open invitation. This little white box is an open invitation to live, to learn, to climb a mountain, to find something, to find yourself. I found myself, because of this little white box, at 20,000 feet on the side of a mountain, uh, gripping to the side of this mountain with two ice axes, tied to three men uh, on a fixed line, staring down into a crevasse, the bottom of which I couldn't see, uh, and feeling very uncomfortable. You see, we were searching for the missing black box of Eastern Airlines Flight 980. This is a plane that crashed into uh, Mount Illimani in Bolivia in 1985, uh, killing all 29 aboard. So when I came across, uh, <clears throat> as, we were, as we were searching for this black box, uh, I had this idea uh, that we ought to go look for it. And I pitched this idea to my buddy Isaac. Now, Isaac, he, uh, he's a great friend. And he's the kind of friend that already had vacation plans. And he told me, I have plans to go sail a boat and sit on a beach and relax. And I offered him a different kind of vacation. I offered him a vacation that guaranteed a little bit of risk, guaranteed a little bit of cold, and it guaranteed uh, that there would be a whole host of unknowns with not enough oxygen to figure it out. Now, there are a couple reasons, a couple things you have to know about me as a veteran to understand why I might do such a thing. First, I think suffering is fun. <laughs> I think you have to believe that to have served in the military. Something about carrying 80 pounds on your back, going through ranger school in the middle of the night, fueled by nothing but an MRE and an intense fear of failure. <laughs> I heard that. Something about that leads you to believe that climbing to 20,000 feet on the side of a mountain is not only a possible endeavor, but worthwhile. Second, I've lost a, na a natural and reasonable sense of boundaries. After witnessing... <laughs> We've got some veterans in the room. <laughs> After witnessing some nonsensical violence and uh, in an environment where I could have been killed, blown up, or shot on one of over 400 combat patrols in Baghdad in 2006 and 7, I left, this, left that environment and left the military with that, this idea that there is no risk that is too great. There's no voice inside my head that says, you shouldn't do this. This is, this is crazy. Uh, this is too dangerous. You don't have the experience. And third, I've developed this irrational idea that I can do anything, that anything is possible. And so, you know, this needle in a haystack search that I went out on with a couple friends seemed to me not impossible, but something that I should spend my time doing. And so, as I mentioned, when I considered going on this search, I first began by Googling this little white box here, uh, that Malaysian aircraft that crashed a couple years back, MH370. And I followed this, this rabbit hole uh, to a Wikipedia page listing the 19 unrecovered black boxes in the history of aviation. And then I Google mapped, of course, Mount Illimani, Bolivia. Uh, the reason listed for this particular black box being unrecovered uh, was that it was high altitude and inaccessible terrain. So what does that mean? So of course, you pull out Google Maps and take a look. And I did that little thing where you kind of angle the Google Map a little bit to see how high it looks on your computer screen. And it didn't look that high. <laughs> so uh, I pitched this to my buddy Isaac. Uh, and he said, of course, this is a good idea. Let's do it. So we reached out to a guy named Pete. Pete works at Outside Magazine, and if you want to know more about this story, uh, we're in the current issue of Outside Magazine. There's a whole 10-page article with cooler pictures than this uh, and uh, better words than I, I might be able to say. Uh, if you want to hear more also, there's uh, the Outside Magazine podcast. Pete runs the podcast. I love Pete. You should listen to the podcast. 
We reached out to Pete uh, about a month before the trip, and on short notice, he agreed to come along with us, and he rented the altitude tent to sleep in, which is miserable, by the way, uh, for the month preceding the trip, and, and he, we met him in Miami in the airport after telling him a couple times by text that because he would be the largest in the group, he would be the first that we would cannibalize <laughs> if it came to that. This was before we met him. And he's, he still got on the plane. <laughs> on the left, you see Pete. Uh, our guide, we found a guide in La Paz. Our guide was teaching us how to use tools that were previously foreign to us, ice axes, crampons, things that would be crucial for our survival once we got up on the mountain. So Pete on the left here, he's scaling this piece of ice near vertically, looking like an Arctic monkey. On the right, this is 10 days after he learned how to use crampons and ice axes. He's looking a little less comfortable. In fact, he's not even within shouting distance of his comfort zone. You see, his crampon had been slipping off of his boot multiple times that day uh, at the worst possible moments. And he's tied to me and Isaac and Robert, three other men who, should Pete fall, uh, we're responsible for grabbing onto the ice as quick as we can, as hard as we can, to prevent all of us from falling into this crevasse. Robert told us after crossing this particular traverse that there were a couple of folks who had not successfully crossed this traverse, uh, this uh, traverse rather. That was a surprise. I'm glad he didn't tell us ahead of time. This right here, this is adventure. Along the way, we met a guy named Jose Lazo. He's in the middle of the picture there. He's a very close friend of Robert, our guide. Uh, so close that, in fact, the pair escaped a protesting an angry mob in Bolivia. There are a lot of protesters and angry mobs at times, if you've ever been there. Uh, by running into the Andean Mountains for a couple weeks and several hundred miles. They're very close. In this photo here, Jose had just finished teaching me a little Spanish. I'm not gifted with uh, uh, multiple languages. See, the, uh, the vets in the room will recognize the big orange bottle that I've got in my hand as Gold Bond. Yeah, <laughs> it'll, it'll keep you from getting blisters and keep you clean for a while. So that bottle of gold bond uh, to Jose, who had been serving as our cook and had been helping around the, uh, around the camp, it looked a lot like the powdered milk that he put on our granola every morning. And so he, was uh, he didn't put it together. He didn't put the gold bond in the granola. Uh, but he was teaching me some Spanish here. Uh, he took to calling the gold bond piernas con leche. If anybody speaks Spanish, that's feet with milk. <laughs> Some jokes cross language barriers, it turns out. There are others I'll tell you later. This is a black box. Little known fact, a black box is orange. <laughs> and of course, this is only a piece of it. Uh, a black box consists of two pieces, both of which are critical for investigators after a plane crash to read the data off of and determine the what and the how in the last moments of a plane's flight. The two pieces are a flight data recorder, which record the altitude, direction, speed of a plane at all moments of the flight. And the second is a cockpit voice recorder that records all of the conversation in the cockpit that is not transmitted over radio. This is where you'll hear pilots say things that are important to the investigation. Four expeditions have gone up Mount Ilimani since 1985, January 1, 1985. Uh, and none of those expeditions have found the black box, either the flight data recorder or the cockpit voice recorder. Additionally, none of the four expeditions have found any human remains. There were no bodies from this crash. Uh, so in fact, there were 29 casketless funerals in the United States, in Chile, Paraguay, uh, and in South Korea. After rigorously, rigorously searching a one square mile area about 3,000 feet lower on the mountain, from the impact site at 19,600 feet, we found uh, the metal casings of both the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. And we found a spool of tape and many fragments of magnetic tape that potentially are from the two recorders. Uh, in fact, they're in my kitchen right now. So we found this tape. That's not a joke. Uh, we found this tape uh, that could potentially, potentially holds the answers for uh, families who have had open questions for several decades. There are uh, complex international laws and bureaucracy that we're in the middle of wading through 
uh, and we have learned quite a bit about that. Uh, you see, when a plane crashes in a country, that country is in charge of the investigation, so the Bolivians must invite the Americans to participate, to assist with the investigation, as yet they have, have not done so. So we've got these two black boxes uh, in our house, and we're working with, uh, with local governments. Um, we're working with the NTSB. Uh, we've talked to the State Department, and we're trying to reach out to the Bolivians to get them to give us permission. Additionally, we're working with governmental officials in La Paz uh, to help them go back to uh, the place uh, at the base of Illimani's Glacier, uh, where we found and buried uh, some of the human remains from the flight. This potentially is impact. Adventure, connection, and impact. These three things together have become the core of my own personal mission statement. As a civilian, I try to keep these forefront in my mind, whether I am traveling far away uh, on the next expedition or closer to home where I serve on the local school committee trying to improve education for urban families. These three things, for me, have guided my life as a civilian and will continue to do so. And so I'll leave you with one question. What are you doing in your life? What are you doing next that will provide you with adventure, connection, and impact? My name is Dan Futrell, and I'm a U.S. Army veteran. Thank you.